Hello and welcome to Spaceship Earth. My name's Dan Burgess. The concept of Spaceship Earth is quite simple. We are living on a life-giving planet, hurtling through space, a bit like a spaceship. It has a finite amount of supplies and an intelligent operating system which keeps everything replenished as long as we all use it wisely. So an understanding of how this system works, along with deep cooperation between humans, is essential to keep us and the spaceship flying. So in this podcast series, I'm having conversations with folks who are responding to the needs of Spaceship Earth, involved in healing and restoring, raising awareness and consciousness, and reimagining how we can live through creativity, ideas, collaborations, new forms of business, and much more. I'll be talking to artists, photographers, entrepreneurs, writers, designers, activists, healers, creative mavericks, and many more. You've probably been hearing about the ocean plastics problem. If you spend any time in the ocean, surfing, swimming, hanging out, or living on the coasts, you've been aware of this for many years. It's not new news. If you haven't heard about it, you're possibly either a hermit or living on another planet. But have you heard of Boreo? In this episode, I'm talking with David Stover, co-founder of Boreo. Boreo is what I'd call a restorative business, based in California, with a mission to protect the ocean. They've figured out how to take old fishing nets out of the ocean, of which there are vast quantities, transform them through a recycling process into new plastic material, and then use that to create awesome products like skateboards, surf fins, clothing, sunglasses and more, as well as communicating through the products our relationships with the ocean and helping many of us understand our impacts and shift our behaviours. In this conversation, I'm interested in understanding how David and his fellow co-founders started the venture, what drove them to focus on the ocean pollution problem, and how they ended up starting the business in Chile, working with fishermen and local communities. He talks about their connection to the ocean from a young age and having that awareness of human impacts on the ocean. He talks about the challenges of jacking in a well-paid job and profession to go against the flow and start a venture around something they care deeply about about receiving investment from Patagonia and now the future direction of Boreo. So I hope you enjoy it. Let's, uh, let's connect with David. Well, David, thank you so much for, um, for finding the time to chat to me. Um, before we dig into uh, Boreo and the mission and, and everything you're up to now, I'd love just to sort of kick off with um, just a bit more like, of your story, like how you got to where you are now, you know, a bit of context. I think, you know, obviously I know your work and others will, but there'll be a lot of folks that won't have come across the work you're doing. And I'm really interested in just kind of how you got to doing what you're doing. So is that all right? We just get a bit of a bit, a bit of your story. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I think um, it'll just be a part of it because, you know, there's, there's four people on the team that really have been an integral part of launching it. But I mean, from, from as far as our personal stories, there are a lot of parallels there. Um, we all grew up in the New England area of the U.S., so kind of, you know, cold winters and not unlike the weather that uh, that you have over there across the pond. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we all grew up around the water. I'm from a coastal town called Block Island. It's um, disconnected from the mainland of the U.S., so the only way to get there is by a single-engine plane or, or a ferry boat that runs a couple times a day and um, seven miles by three miles, so quite a small island with obviously the Atlantic Ocean surrounding on all sides and you know I think I didn't realize it as a kid but as I got older you kind of realize how the places that you grew up in shape you and you know I really grew up around the ocean that was something that really was a big part of our life whether we were going to the beach every day in the summer as we got older we were you know surfing and and traveling around to find waves or fishing and swimming and sailing it was Hmm. just something that was at, at everyday part of what we did our whole life and nice. if you weren't in the water in the winter when it was you know negative degrees which we occasionally were you at least were driving by it and appreciating it so I think that that had a really big impact on me as a as a kid growing up and mm-hmm. I think quite similarly um, Ben and Kevin and Greg on our team um, all grew up you know we grew up within 60 miles of each other even though we didn't all know each other growing up Um, So they had a a very similar experience to that. And um, I think the other thing that I've started to realize is that the community that I grew up in and now I know is is very much into conservation. Um, The whole actually the whole town is has put 60 percent of 
land into conservation that can never be developed. And that's been going on wow. for decades, um, which is basically half the town is a national park. Um, wow. You know, there was uh, a diligent work crew from when I was a kid that would go around and pick up any litter they would see. So you would see very few. You still to this day see very little litter around the town. And then on the beaches as a kid where we actually would go to the beach, I never actually saw I never thought I saw pollution um, because it's very, very rare. Um, but now that I've gone mm. back, even that place, which is pretty isolated um, in the Atlantic, there's a there's a south and a southwest coast that gets pretty, pretty uh, littered and, um, you know, kind of crushed with this this issue of plastic pollution. So, yeah, I think mm. I think um, that has been a very critical part um, of my life and, and kind of like got us started. And and where we really, um, you know, the ideas with Boreo got started is when I came together with Ben and, and Kevin and Greg and, you know, as friends growing up, we were just getting into our careers, um, probably got a little late start on the entrepreneur thing. You know, we were, we were all 25 to 27 when we got started and we mm -hmm. had some professional experience, which I think we needed. We all had gone to university. We all had degrees. We all mm -hmm. had gone into respective different fields of, of work. And, you know, we were pro young professionals. We had wore suits to work and had deliverables. The suit, the old suit. Yeah, wrote, <laughs> wrote, wrote reports and very like, I mean, I was keeping track of every hour of my day, every work day um, for almost six years. Like I was doing, I was a consultant and it was something that uh, really funded my, my lifestyle and let me kind of grow into, um, in, into explore what I really wanted to do. And more importantly, I think for me, it let me see the world. Like I, I had the opportunity to do projects in several different continents and spend a couple of years living in Australia and um, really taking advantage of travel whenever I could with work and being productive in at work. Like we weren't passionate about it. Um, it was interesting. Uh, we liked the people we worked with. I mean, none of us like hated our lives. Sure. It was just one of those things where at the end of the day, like, do you feel good about what you do every day? And are you making a positive impact on, on the planet? And like, I really, truly believe that's why we all stop. That's an, that's, said, that's an interesting one, though, isn't it? That, that making that positive impact. Was that was that always in your kind of psyche or, you know, always something that was kind of front of mind when you were going into your first career? Or was it because I'm interested no. in that? Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think even in college, it was... Um, you know, I was an engineer, so interested in figuring out how things worked. And, you know, for a while, that's what I wanted to do. And then I got to be a, like at my last year of engineering school. And I was like, I don't think I want to sit in front of a computer and design stuff. And um, I got an opportunity to work in finance, which I didn't know much about. But I figured it was just an extension of my education. And I could learn if I liked it. And I ended up liking it. And, um, you know, I ended up doing that for six years. But I think when I, when you, you start your career, it's all new and fresh and exciting. And, you know, I think people might even spend too much time at a young age trying to figure out, okay, exactly what they need to do. Mm. So I think it's just getting into it and, and knowing that, okay, let's, where do I want to gather skills? And then that process will help you figure out like what you really want to do. And I think for us, that was really important. We all kind of grew up in that corporate job after, um, after university. And then, and then it was kind of like we, you get to this point in your career where you're like, okay, either I keep going here, the money gets better, it gets safer, I buy a house, or at some point it's like you, you reach that kind of point of no return. And I think we all recognize that, <laughs> you know, after working for five years and it was like, for, for, for me, when we first started talking about it, it was always like, okay, we know we want to give back. We're really tied to this issue of plastic pollution. I think we really looked at it as like a career break. Like, let's take a year and do something kind of wild. Um, you know, may, let's go start a recycling project somewhere. Mm. We, we had some friends that were collecting plastic on the beach. We, we talked about this kind of shared model that would collect plastic and, and incentivize would eventually like help pay people to do that. That, that was the first idea. So, you were, so you, were, you were sort of consciously the kind of plastics thing, the pollution thing was just there. It was sort of, it was already in your kind of minds as like something oh, you were feeling totally. really uncomfortable about. Yeah, I mean, we became, this, was what, how many, I, this was a few years back, right? This would be... This is 2010, yeah. 2011. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, when I was actually living in Australia, I, I think 
the issue really hit me in the face quite literally when um, I traveled to Indonesia. I was surfing all around Australia and I had traveled to Indonesia and, um, you know, where the plastic, you can't miss it. It's like, it's not like, you know, you, you glaze over it. Um, it's there. And then, you know, we were living at the time, Ben and I, Ben's one of the, the co-founders, Ben Kneppers. We had an apartment in Manly Beach, Australia, which is this beautiful <laughs> town, Sydney Harbor, there's a surf beach there. And pristine from all aspects, except, you know, you went down after a rainstorm in the harbor beaches or on the beach and like there's plastic. It's it's Sydney. It's a clean city, but they do very well of keeping it that way. It's safe. But this issue of plastic pollution has a way to get to every nook and corner of almost every beach you can visit. And that's when it really dawned on us. We were like, okay, this is something that, you know, we want to enjoy the ocean environment the way that we remember it as a kid um, and the way that we know that it should be remembered. And so we started basically this research project while we were working. We had our corporate jobs, but reading books. Um, Charles Moore wrote a book, Plastic Oceans, that talked about, you know, sailing out into the gyre. Marcus Erickson had published some work. There wasn't a whole lot out there. Mm. Um, compared to now, 2010 to 2012, which is when yeah. we were kind of getting going. Because I remember the issue yeah. was, yep. I remember, I remember, I just remember coming across Chris Jordan's work in 2010 mm-hmm. or 2011, I think. You know, yep. the albatross photos. Um, yep. And like that, that because that was my sort of first like, wow, you know. Yeah. But like you say, it yeah. was sort of, it was still pretty. You know, it wasn't really um, on the kind of surface still, so to speak. Yeah, well, that was really the launch of it. So we, um, you know, we met Tim Silverwood from Take Three. He had a, a, you know, he's kind of a founder of that movement in Australia where he was encouraging everyone to take three pieces of plastic when they mm-hmm. went down the beach. And, you know, we kind of said to him, we're like, you know, we want to do something to help. And, you know, this is our background. And we have this idea that we want to collect some of this plastic and put value into it and make people think differently about it. And he was like, great. He's like, do it. (laughs) He's just kind of like, you know, and all, all encouragement there was like, you know, just, you know, I said that we were scared about leaving work and doing everything else. And, you know, he was pretty encouraging and obviously we had spun around ideas internally for, you know, better part of a year or two about what we were actually going to do, but we knew we wanted to do something, um, to help ease the issue of plastic pollution, which to be honest, um, you know, many people still oversimplify the general public thinks of ocean plastic as this like one type of plastic. And we were in the same boat when we started. I'm sorry, we're getting a helicopter no overhead. That's good. Whereabouts are um, you exactly? Just so let, let us know. I, yeah. So I'm actually, uh, I, we work at a studio in Ventura, California. I'm just outside right now. Got it. Give the other guys some space from my voice, but <laughs> we're, um, yeah, we're, we're based, uh, it's kind of, uh, in Southern California, but, um, it, about it an sounds, hour and a half it north of Los warm. Angeles. It sounds warm. It's about 70 <laughs> degrees and sunny today. Is it? And that's pretty, it's probably like that 85% of the year. Yeah. I, I'm just, just so you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm in a, a, like a shed in the bottom of my garden with a, with a log burning stove. And, nice. And a hat nice. Freezing. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> Back to the story. What town, <laughs> what town is that? So, in? so I live out in, uh, I spend my time between London and Bath. Bath's out near Bristol West. It's a West country basically. Okay. Um, yeah. Southwest yep. of, of England. Cool. So awesome. I've been to, I've been to Cornwall, I've surfed in Cornwall. Have you? Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. So it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's much easier to get to Cornwall from here than it is from London. Yeah. So, so uh, my, 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 my nearest break is, is South Wales. It's like oh, an hour and a quarter. Awesome. Um, but anyway, anyway, right. So, so, so tell me, so, so you're on this, you're, you know, it's, it's something's emerging. You're, you're about to sort of jack the jobs in by the sound of things. Yeah. And so we, uh, basically what happened was we had a friend, um, or Ben on our team who I was living with had a friend from Chile who was actually working with his, Ben was an environmental consultant and this guy, um, Christian Quito, I would surf with in the morning in Australia and, and Ben worked with him and, um, you know, he told Ben, he's like, Hey, I think the work you're doing in Australia, this environmental consulting work is something they really would, would need in Chile and South America. And, uh, mm. and he basically, and Ben was looking for a change. His girlfriend at the time was from Brazil. There was a lot of reasons why he wanted to move to South America. And, um, he had been in Australia longer than me. I think Ben had been there three and a half years or maybe longer. Uh-huh. Um, 
and he's just a very global person has lived in Africa and Ireland and um, was really ready for the next adventure. And, you know, we talked about it and certainly I, I pushed him to do it. And, um, you know, I think he was the one that, you know, really decided that it was the time to go. And, um, but it didn't stop us with our ideas. Like we were kind of at that point knee deep into exploring what we could do. And it was kind of like, let's just keep it going remotely while you're in, while you're in Chile. And, Mm -hmm. um, and so he took this job as an innovation, um, consultant for the government in Chile and, uh, he moved there to Santiago and I was still working in Australia. And when he got there, he started to hear about these programs and the innovation and development that they wanted to do in Chile. And we found out about this program called startup Chile, where you could submit a business plan and they'd review it. And if accepted, they gave you office space and $40,000. And we were like, okay, wow. well, maybe this is our start. Hmm. And, um, and before, just before we kind of knew that we got accepted to that, um, I decided to leave my job. I was at the end of a, an assignment. I was in an international assignment in Australia for two years. And uh, I was coming to the end of that and was going to plan some travel in between. And so I just said, like, hey, I'll focus on, you know, working with you to write this business plan and the application and, and we'll just have a go. If it doesn't work, then mm-hmm. have to figure it out and go get another job. Yeah, what's next? I, I was pretty confident yeah. that I, I had a good relationship with all the people I worked with and, and there was a backup plan in early days. <laughs> Um, That's good. Which was good, yeah. So I wasn't leaving on bad terms or anything, and uh, and so we we actually got um, we got a little workspace in Boston through Ben's University Northeastern, and um, at that point decided to just basically focus a summer, um, a North American summer, on getting together our business plan and ideas, and we worked with um, there's, there was a guy Greg Del Mole and. Um, a couple of of younger students that we worked with through this program called idea at Northeastern, which is basically a student run incubator, um, which was pretty cool. Um, cause we got to be around some other entrepreneurs and, you know, we, we weren't based there every day. Like at that point I was kind of, um, staying with my parents a little bit. Ben and I were kind of crashing with friends and we basically over like a three month period got some very rough research done at a local university in Boston where we had collected our first kind of rounds of fishing nets at that point, um, which I can kind of get back to why we landed on that. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, Give me a sense of timing in this. So what's the sort of, what time scale are we talking from this kind of like, you know, seeing this thing popping up in, in Chile of the, mm-hmm. you know, this, this, this opportunity and what sort of, what's the timeline here we're talking about? Ben, and, and, and... ben moved to Chile this, um, basically July 2012. Um, and then he was at his job for roughly a year the, as a consultant. And towards the end of that first year is when we kind of were accepted into this program in Boston and okay. had started writing the business plan. And we, we had a pretty good idea. It wasn't too far off at that point. We had a, I think we had the name for the company by the end of that year, Boreo. Um, and Where, where's, where, give me, just give me the, the background on that on Boreo. Yeah. So Boreo is a name. Yeah. It actually, um, that was through a brainstorm with friends in Chile. It actually means the waves in a native language in <laughs> Chile. And nice. for us, it was like as surfers and people that grew up around the water, like, you know, we wanted to connect, um, you know, this idea of like a wave of plastic and wave of innovation. And there was analogy of like, you know, a wave starts something small and, and grows from there. And so it was a really good, uh, yeah, it was just something that we all liked. We liked the sound of it. We liked that it. it was interesting. It was hard to say. Um, and, and people, Lovely. and people kind of like just went along with it. So yeah, once, once we had that, um, I mean, the next step, really the challenge was that, you know, we were going to apply to this program in Chile, startup Chile. This is, um, this is mid 2013. And, um, and that's when, you know, Kevin on our team was like, okay, well, you guys know we can't just collect all the plastic and melt it down and make products out of it. It's just going to fall apart. It's going to be cheap. It's, it's cool. It's going to be like artwork, but just not really going to be functional. And at this point we had established, we wanted to make a skateboard cause we had kind of gone back and forth and ideas forever. Um, you know, initially we were looking at surf fins and trash cans and wetsuit, all types of stuff that anything you can imagine made from plastic, we probably had had it written down and went through it. And, um, Ben was actually doing, uh, 
doing a study on the environmental impact of Lollapalooza, the concert in Chile. And um, it was just like, holy shit, all these kids are riding these plastic skateboards. Like we, we have, like we had these little cruisers, little wood cruisers that we rode to check the surf in Australia. He's like, why don't we just make little cruiser boards out of the plastic? And we started sharing that idea with a couple of people and they were like, oh, that's like, that's perfect. Like, that's like, gets to the point of what you're trying to do, connects to surfing, adds some enjoyment in it. And that was like, that's when things started to really like go because it was like, okay, let's write a business plan on starting the skateboard company. Like, this is what we're going to do. Brilliant. And um, so the product, the product just came and that was it. That's like, that's our first product. Off we go. Yeah, exactly. And, and um, I think in the beginning we had sites that we'd be a little skateboard company and, you know, we'd. We'd sell so many thousands of boards every year, and we it, this is something that we we build small, and eventually we're this you know this skateboard brand, and um and and I think two two interesting things happened. One, um, we quickly got into the material much deeper than we imagined because it was like okay, we're not going to collect all of this scrap plastic and melt it down to make a board. That we need to really focus on the supply chain and where we're getting material from. And that, so after the idea came for the skateboard, we really hunkered down and looked at, do we look at PET bottles? Do we look at existing recycling infrastructure? And at the end of the day, we, we came up with this. It was just to say, okay, there's all this plastic coming in the ocean. What are the most um, harmful and obnoxious forms of that plastic? And what doesn't have a solution to recycle it? And we saw alternatives for bottles. We saw recycling programs. And we kind of stumbled across this issue of fishing nets because we were doing a study on marine debris. NOAA had published some reports that identified fishing nets as being uh, about 10% of the plastic pollution in the ocean. And Ben had actually done a study on the wild caught fishing industry in, in Chile and had said, went to the fishermen and asked them about it. Um, and naively, we were asking them about what types of pollution do you see in the ocean at that point? We hadn't really fixated on fishing nets. And and then it came up with them. They're like, well, you know, there's a big problem with nets. They're, pl- they're plastic-based. They're all made from plastics. And we don't really have an end-of-life solution for them. And we know that sometimes they're mismanaged. Like these fishermen burn them on the beach or they're left in the harbors. And we were like, huh, well, that's pretty interesting. And we, we did like a, a quick survey with some fishermen in Chile and, and basically just said, well, maybe we should pitch that we'll set up this program that will collect back their nets and recycle them. Uh, and we'll use that material, which is a consistent form of plastic for the skateboard. And, um, and that, that's what we did. I mean, that's, we moved to Chile in, in mid 2013, we got accepted to the program, obviously startup Chile, um, all of, had officially left our jobs at that point, um, and moved there and lived in an apartment in Santiago and basically spent the weekends going to the coast and meeting fishermen and finding waves to surf when we could. And then the week's in the city, uh, you know, trying to, to work with a recycler to, you know, f- make this process efficient to be able to collect nets and recycle it and, and build a product out of it. And, you know, that, that's what we did for the first year there. And by mid 2013, uh, sorry, mid 2014, um, like, so it would have been May or June, we launched a Kickstarter for the, for the first skateboard. Um, which, which was the minnow, which was the minnow. Yeah. So that was about three and a half years ago. Um, you know, and we, we were in Chile at that point. No one knew who we were. We didn't have any press. Like we didn't really, we didn't know anything about crowdfunding. We, we had heard about it and just made a little video with our friend and, and had made the first prototype board and then kind of just sent it out to the world. And, um, you know, I think we asked for 25,000 and raised 60. So it wasn't like a crazy success. It was just, like uh, at least a small validation that like okay you guys are on the right path people are interested in this and um yeah which was because i guess that that, i mean that that, because the crowdfunding thing can be can be terrifying isn't it? i've worked on a couple of of campaigns and on kickstarter and it's just i guess that's the thing isn't it you know you you're sort of believing in something and you think you've got you know this this idea's got legs and it's purposeful and i think yeah until you put it out there right (laughs) and i think i think of the our timing was just lucky because at the time it was like crowdfunding was was still it was it was early on it wasn't it had been around for a while but it was still interesting like press ended up picking it up they're like oh these these american guys are living in chile and they're collecting these nets and making these boards like we got some lucky hits off that and then obviously the movement um 
becoming aware of ocean plastics helped us because people started to think about what can be done. And this was like one, you know, obviously this isn't a, a solution that covers the problem, but it was an example of something that could be done. And I think mm -hmm. that really helped us get people to share that story, which was key early on um, to do that. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, from there, we, we basically made the first run of skateboards, um, didn't make any money <laughs> Kickstarter campaign. I mean, that's, that's like a, a lesson learned there. Those Kickstarter campaigns are like, by the time you produce all the content and get through production and manage the inventory and pay for shipping and deal with everything else. It's like, at the end of the day, we were like broke as we were when we started, but we, yeah. we at least had some, but you had a fan base, we had a fan base. exactly. You had a starting point. And, um, and later that summer, because of that campaign, um, we, uh, we actually had an opportunity to, uh, to pitch to, uh, to Patagonia. They had picked mm. up on the campaign from, a, from a media outlet and, um, and the investment director of Patagonia called us up and was like, Hey, this is Patagonia's interested in exploring, uh, more recycled materials and supply chains and really liked what you guys did with your skateboard. Would you be interested in coming and sitting down and sharing your story? And, um, and that actually, and he went, no, no, thanks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it was surreal. The whole thing was surreal because we had just amazing been trying to figure out like, okay, now we need to go out and get some funding. It was like, just got a phone call one day or an email, like a one line email, like, um, hi, my name's Phil and I'm the investment director at Patagonia. Will you come down and, and sit down and tell your story? And we had some friends there. And so like we had a good friend, uh, Chris Evans, who was really involved in Chile, who, we had talked to and actually pitched the story at Patagonia to, to him and he connected us to some people and he had been a really early advisor for us and someone we still trust and, and, um, and asked for feedback and he's really helped kind of shape our journey. And so we get to the meeting and, and Phil, you know, we have the introductions and they say, Oh, did Chris, uh, you know, did Chris share our story? And it was, it was funny cause he was like, no, actually someone else just picked up on it and sent it over. So we kind of had someone on the inside, um, that knew a little bit about us, even though uh, even though Patagonia wasn't even, the investment team wasn't aware of that. And I think that really helped us because mm -hmm. we could kind of point to Chris and he could tell a bit of our story too without it all coming from us, which was which was really helpful. Um, and I think that the biggest change that that relationship has had, and um, in a very positive way, and um, kind of forced us to rethink about it is that. I mean, the skateboard was really a proof of concept for us. It was to say, um, you know, hey, this can be done. And it's a great example of how you can disrupt the way a product is made and innovate a material that's previously looked at as a waste. And for us, it was like our deeper mission really wasn't to become a skateboard company. Like we're, we were in this to make a difference and help our oceans. And, um, you know, I think we got blinded in that first year. We had to be so fixated on figuring out how, how do we make the product? How do we get the supply chain going? And then when we yeah. stepped back, it was like, okay, well, clearly the bigger opportunity here for us to have an impact is to really build this collection program and collect as much nets as we can and, and figure out um, solutions to, to use that efficiently. And, you know, we really kind of worked internally on this through with the help of Patagonia is like, let's focus on products that are long lasting, that are quality with end of life solutions. Like we're not going to put this into packaging. We're not going to make cheap, like $5 products out of it that are going to get thrown away or left on a beach. Like we're going to look at products yeah. that use plastic, um, in a way that's effective and they can be a resource, um, or an outlet for this material that's lying around on beaches or dumped illegally or, at best in the landfill clogging up, um, the soil. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, over the last now that was in 2014. So over the last three and a half years, our kind of path has been developing these projects, both internally. I mean, we have, we did another skateboard with Carver that we developed with them. Um, we did, uh, you know, we, we've done sung a sunglass project. We've done a fin project. We made Frisbees. We just released Jenga. So we've kind of yay. We just got. I've just got the Jenga. Nice. That was, uh, so we just we just got the Jenga. We, um, me and the kids have been playing the Jenga at the weekend. Awesome. Uh, it's fantastic. Um, 
so just yeah just just desc- i mean you know describe now and you sort of you know if, if someone now is coming across boreo how how what, what are you now what's the sort of so, the kind of essence now yeah i mean boreo is focused on finding innovative solutions to keep this harmful waste out of the ocean and you know we we have a brand for the material now it's called net plus and we're kind of focused on scaling um in chile now but we hope to grow beyond that very shortly scaling this operation where we can build these community-based programs, which Ben has worked very, very diligent at that over the last uh, five plus years. Where you know we're not just going and taking this material; um, we're working directly with the fishermen, we're educating them, we're implementing these systems where the nets can be collected back. There's um, financial incentives that go into the communities that we work with, and it's done on a on a per kilo on a weight basis. Um, we've built some solar systems for schools. We've built some compost bins. We've uh, implemented uh, additional recycling infrastructure at schools and communities. And basically, we're just not just taking this material. We're working with the communities, obviously paying fair labor to people that are working with us there, and then giving an additional incentive to, to help have a positive environmental impact in these areas. Um, and that's a deep mission that we have and, and so as we grow this and that's and that and i guess that's right that's you know that's complex stuff right in the in a in a sort of in the sort of old sort of model i guess all the the, the sort of you know industrialized kind of efficient <laughs> efficiency model which you probably could argue is why we're in so much of this mess but yeah. you know this what you're doing it's 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 human scale almost right um, yeah and that's it's funny you say that because we, we actually have a partnership this year with a company called human scale but uh, and they make ergonomic <laughs> office furniture and uh, you know quite large, uh, quite large provider and and that that's that's kind of where we've shifted is like we're still doing those projects we still want to work on the fun projects like Jenga where it's education tool it's going to kids they pick up the product they play with it they understand it but now mm-hmm. we also have this opportunity to work with these um, companies with established markets that ha- that rely on these plastics as a as a raw material and say um it's not easy it's not like it's an easy swap out but find products where our material properties match that can utilize this material and replace it and then they can become a part of our story um and that's what's really happening now is you know we're working with um furniture company we have with patagonia we have a couple of development projects on uh for their different sources of plastic they use from anything from trims to apparel to all sorts of of different product lines that we've been working with them on and the idea is that we can tell our story through these larger brands that that need to utilize this responsible material and then that allows us to kind of grow the programs and really fulfill the mission that we want to do and so yeah that's fantastic that's kind of been the evolution of of Boreo in the last couple years and you know our our vision now is that you know, we'll align with these credible partners across industry sectors that can use this material. And, um, you know, obviously not just a, a uh, end of life solution for that material, but also being a part of this broader movement to to bring awareness to the issue of plastic pollution. We have close ties to a lot of um, NGOs and nonprofits that we work with and not just going to beach cleanups, which is really important i think the, the the biggest thing a beach cleanup does is brings awareness so that people come out they see that it's a problem they actually have a tangible impact by picking it off the beach and then hopefully they go home and they question do i really need this straw do i really need this plastic water bottle like how can i mm. cut my individual consumptions and i think we see those two things um, being companies making products differently and consumers consuming differently as as a real solution to kind of solving this waste problem that we have. Yeah. What what is um you know obviously you know you've just told that story and you know this the ocean pollution uh, story itself that's obviously been growing and growing and growing as we're putting more and more stuff in into the oceans. But also I guess it feels like I don't know at least in the UK this this last year the last six months particularly it's sort of really getting into um the public consciousness Mm -hmm. um what what what, what's why why is it tipping now do you think why are we starting to get this mass awareness i mean i I think um similar to my own experience you know when i was surfing and became aware of this problem i I think the ocean is a captivating place and i think 
a lot of people, even people that don't live directly on the ocean that, that visit it, they can get on board with saying that this is a vital part of our of our earth. It's a vital part of our life. And, you know, even if they don't understand the science of how, you know, the earth really depends on the health of the ocean, they can understand mm-hmm. that when they go to a beach, they don't want to see a trash dump. And, you know, I think in the last five years, the amount of um, activists and uh, politicians and uh, movie stars and sports stars that have gone out and become a voice for, you know, the pictures, um, the videos, the just the awareness yeah. that's come to the issue. It's you can't miss it now. I, I mean, I, I know that we're in a bubble, especially being in California and, and in this environmental <laughs> space, like we're very much in a bubble. But I do think it's become um, significantly more mainstream and you know, you, you have, um, you have big foundations, you have big events, you have governments making mandates on, um, bans for certain types of plastic. I mean, there's, there's a huge momentum shift in the last five years. And, um, you know, I, I, not to say that we need to become comfortable because I, I think if, if you look at the raw numbers of it, that being said, like it, I'm not convinced. And I actually think that you could argue the other way that there's empirical data there, that there's probably more, way more plastic in the ocean now than there was five years ago. And, mm-hmm. you know, the reality of it is that the plastics industry creates more new plastic every year. And our consumption of plastic goes up every year as the, as the population and demand for that material goes up. And so, you know, now that we have this awareness and that people are becoming aware of how it's um, impacting, I think the next big shift is going to be in the way that we consume, the way that we look at but waste, and then the way that companies are kind of forced to make products in a more responsible way. And I think I think we've hit the start of that, but we hope that that's just kind of the tip of that iceberg, and um, it's really going to propel companies and regulations and and consumers to really get together and say enough is enough. Like we've been trashing the system that we all rely on for way too long. Like there's a, there's a fix here. Like we make products in an economy that there isn't an end of life. Like to me, like I would love by the end of our lifetime that this word waste doesn't, doesn't make sense. Right. I mean, you, you make organic things that you can compost and you make inorganic things that can be reused and put into other things. I mean, it's just, doesn't make sense to, to dig a hole in the ground and dump it and assume that that's something that's going to go away. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I guess I guess in, in some ways is as if you know in ten years time or you know do, does even your organisation exist in the future? If if this actually sort of I guess at the moment you know we're we're clearing up the problem, right? This stuff is pouring into the oceans. It has been for years and years and years, and we're pulling it out and we're you know sort of you know innovators like yourselves are trying to find ways to sort of create a whole new systems around this stuff i guess where what does the future look like does it you know if you can stop the streams eventually well i would um, I, we always say that if if there's nothing left to uh to care about or to recycle then you know then we achieve something so it's it's never really been yeah. i mean realistically in in you know is that happening in the next 10 years is not feasible in our lifetime i think so i think i think if we yeah. really all get to work. Um, you know, I think the opportunities become different, right? If you're focused on recycling now, I think in 30 years, uh, you, you probably have a different, you probably have a different purpose in life, you know, like maybe you go into, um, you know, products and focus more on how products can be made from more natural materials. You're innovating with the types of materials that are used. Um, you're looking at, end of life solutions across the entire supply chain, right? It's not the end. It's not just the end product that you get. Um, and I think people yeah. kind of miss that sometimes. It's like all the companies making those end products, then they have all these waste streams that are coming out of there. Like how do we, right. how do we look at the ecology of that and figure out how can we make everything be closed loop, right? We don't want anyone to be dumping anything. Like let's work with nature. Let's yeah. not work against it. Yeah, yeah right. How does nature work? And then uh, <laughs> exactly. that's what we want to be mimicking. I mean, that's, yeah. that's, there's, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of cases for that. Like figuring out how nature has figured out how to do it most efficiently is something that we should pay a lot more attention to because they've been yeah. at it a lot longer than we have. <laughs> Right, exactly. About four and a half billion years. Isn't yeah. it? Um, but um, well, just um, j- so just just a couple of things I was going to ask you about this um, 
kind of this this project that I'm working on right now around you know it's called ocean literacy. It's effectively it's sort of defined as you know uh, if you're ocean literate, sort of understanding the ocean's influence on you and your influence on the ocean. And mm-hmm. and I guess and you know there's a, it's a it's a kind of a slightly sort of academic work that's been done on this and different principles and but effectively you know it's even things like you know many of us have no idea that you know the ocean produces you know vast amounts almost you know 50 percent odd of the oxygen that we breathe for example or defines the climate on land or you know all these kind of things and i guess you know we're looking at a lot from kind of urban populations and and populations that are you know you know the ocean is a destination for many people in their minds you know What's your perspective on that? Like where you are, I mean, you know, are you in a kind of ocean literate culture where people have that depth of understanding of, uh, of the relationship with, with the ocean? Um, I mean, we're certainly in an, in an ocean focused culture, but I would say that literacy is still not what it needs to be. And um, mm. I, I haven't actually seen it, but I understand like one of the most popular shows in, in the UK this year was was one of the new, um, was David one of David Attenborough's new series is that right blue planet two blue planet two yes so like i I think that you know that and that's a great indication too of like you know just where this issue is coming where awareness has come i think it's smart to uh to take a step back and before we bombard people with hey erosions are dying is open them up to you know why it's important that erosions are healthy and you know Mm. i think I think that companies can do that too. I mean, I think if we look at the stream, certainly from our perspective, we look at the next generation being college, university students and, and youth as, as the most moldable because, mm. you know, they're just sponges, you know, and in effect, they actually go home and tell their parents the right thing to do, which is incredible. Whereas you yeah. have older populations and they want to hear it. And I think that they're still interested in being educated, but um, at some point, you know, you, you might also have more challenges in getting them across, you know, a certain point of view or even even facts that they may just not associate with. Um, yeah. And so. So, yeah, I, I think certainly from I think we have a long way to go um, in hopefully a short amount of time and getting across like how important that ocean environment is and then explaining like, OK, here's the problems and here are some things that you can do about it. And I think that's a, a smart approach is like bring awareness um to the general importance and then and then really helping them understand how they can be a part of it and the things that we need to do to take care of it so nice nice so just quickly so Boreo, how what's you know you told me a little bit about the plans for the future how can folks get involved what's uh yeah i mean what can we what... i would say um well one I, I would say act locally um you know in the uk we're good friends with Hugo Tagholm, Surfers Against Sewage, who manages mm-hmm. a lot of the cleanups there. Um, you know, in the U.S. here, there's opportunities to get involved with if you're interested in, in the ocean or if you're interested in, like, even in parks. I mean, national parks do cleanups. But finding a way to, to give back to the environment, connect with your community is huge. And then on a personal level, um, you know, we just encourage people to look at really their plastic consumption and audit their their waste and figure out, okay, do I have an opportunity to compost at home? Can I, when I go out to the cafe, can I refuse my plastic top or can I say no to a straw at a restaurant or can I bring my reusable containers where I go and, and not have to buy packaged food in, in, in plastic wrap? And I think that those are simple actions that can really make a difference when they spread. And, um, you know, staying aware of the campaigns that are happening in your area and and not being afraid to to also pass on that knowledge you know when you see someone and not in a a condescending way but just like hey just so you know i stopped using straws because i found out that there's so many billion that are not recycled every day and um, they're impacting our environment and hey here's a picture of a bird with a, a bottle cap in its in its stomach um you know maybe the the system that we rely on is really broken and i i think those yeah those are small steps that will lead to bigger movements. Um, yeah. I think that sometimes as consumers, people don't understand how much influence they have on big companies. You look at a big company and you think, oh, they'll never change. But guess what? Like if enough consumers demand it, they have to change or, you know, they're going to be, um, you know, if it hurts their business decisions, then they're forced to change. And as consumers, you know, we really have that ability to change that. So. Thank you, David. 
Fact, it's been awesome for uh, chatting to you, getting getting a heads up on the story. I really appreciate your time. Um, so, uh, no worries. Thanks, thanks. I appreciate being able to connect, and uh, hopefully, you're able to keep warm over there. Yeah, we'll be in touch. Sounds good, Dan. Nice chat. Thanks, David. Okay. Take care. See you. Bye. So thank you for listening and um, do check out Boreo.co, spread the word about their awesome work and maybe go and buy the Jenga at least, which is a great way to explore ocean consciousness through the game itself. I really hope you've enjoyed this first episode of Spaceship Earth. Um, I'm learning by doing, so expect things to develop in the next episode. And if you have any questions or thoughts, please do drop me a mail at dan at danburgess.earth. Until next time, peace and out.